I don't know why. Okay, recording has started. Okay, welcome back everyone to our second lecture, BC 110, who we are in Christ. And there were a lot of questions during the break uh, about baptism and all that. I didn't mean to get into that subject. Uh, that was just a passing thing and then it became a big discussion. <laughs> Anyway, Praise the Lord, Pastor. Let we me, can't hear you. Uh, say a few things. Uh, I will explain one more time. I, I didn't mean to get into this, but let me explain because question. So three baptisms, right? I'll ex will explain Pastor, one we more time. Pastor, we can't hear you properly. Uh, so we saw Hebrews six two, the the doctrine of baptisms. I mean, more than one baptism. So I will explain one. So first, we said I mean, the one we said is water baptism. Right. Uh, so this is Matthew, the reference, Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20. Jesus told us, go make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. So there, one believer is baptizing another believer in water, immersing them. The purpose is for that believer to testify. It's a testimony, you know, that that believer has decided to follow Jesus. It's a testament. It's a public testament. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. you know, Acts 2.38. So that's the one, first one, water baptism. Then uh, we said there is Holy Spirit baptism. Right? Holy Spirit baptism. Reference, uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Also Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Holy Spirit baptism. Uh, there are many other references, but we just have a, keep a few. Here, uh, all right, you can all hear. Can you all hear now, clearly? Uh, no, know, Pastor. Okay. All right. So, the Holy Spirit Baptist, where the Lord Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. So the Lord Jesus baptizes the believer in the Holy Spirit. Purpose of the Holy Spirit baptism, it's for power and purity. Right? Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit, purpose is power and purity. It's a, it's a spirit, baptism in fire. Fire burns up the chaff. The third one is baptism into Christ, spiritual, spiritual. That reference is 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. By one Spirit, that means the Holy Spirit, we are all baptized into one body, that is Christ, the body of Christ. The purpose is spiritual union with Jesus. What happens? Which one happens first? Baptism into Christ. That happens first. When does it happen? At the time we are born again. When we are born again, when we receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes us and He puts us into Christ. We are one with Him. He who is joined to the Lord is spiritually one with Him. So from this moment on, we are born again. We have life in our spirit. That life is the life of Jesus given to us. He is the vine. We are the branches. His life comes to us. Without Him, there's no life. Okay? After that, water baptism, Holy Spirit baptism can take place in any order, depending on how God is working. Okay? The other question, again, this, this was not my main point, but one other question was, uh, do you need to be water baptized in order to partake of the Lord's communion, or of the Lord's table? Uh, here's what we believe. We believe it's not necessary to be water baptized. You have to be a believer to take part in Holy Communion. right? Any believer can take part in Holy Communion, because you don't find it mandated anywhere in the New Testament. Now, some churches 
some pastors, some churches will say you have to be water baptized in order to take part in the Holy Communion. That's up to them. Certain denominations have those rules. That's okay. But it's not a biblical mandate. It's a, something they are mandating in order to make sure that only believers take part in the Holy Communion. That's okay. That's their rule, right? But in Scripture, you don't find anywhere it says you have to be baptized in water to take part in the Holy Communion. Communion. The only instruction is First Corinthians 11, right? So, if you think of it, when the twelve apostles took part in the first Lord's Supper, they were not baptized. They were not even born again at that moment, at that time. They were followers of Jesus, but the twelve apostles sitting around and Jesus says, "Take eat this bread, drink this cup." They were not born again. So, what do you mean? Because Jesus had not yet died on the cross. They couldn't be saved. You understand? But did they take part in the Lord's table? Of course. At that moment, they were not born again. When did they get born again? John 20, 21. After Jesus' resurrection, he came to them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. That's the time the apostles got born again. Are you understand? So when Jesus came to the room where they were all, and he said, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. That's the time they were born again. They received the Holy Spirit. And then he told them, wait in Jerusalem to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The difference. You're understanding the difference? Okay. So, uh, so we, 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 we practice that. We allow people, who are, whoever believes in Jesus, who's born again, to partake in the Lord's table. Some churches may do it differently. It's okay. We don't have to fight about this. Whatever rule you want to have in place, it's fine. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any questions, online students? Okay, I know we went off topic somewhere else today, but it's okay. Let's go back to our main topic. Pastor, I can't okay. hear you properly, Pastor. Sorry. Fine. Your voice is very slow. I can't hear you, Pastor. Let's go back. Let me share the notes, and then we'll... All right, so we stopped now in lesson number 14. Let's think about this. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So when you are joined to the Lord, you and I spiritually get connected. Spiritually, we become one with Jesus. Okay? So, physically, everything is normal. You're the same. Mentally, same. But in your spirit, something has changed. You have now become connected to Jesus in your spirit. So everything that God is going to work in our lives from now on is going to come through this. Through our union with Jesus, through our spirit, the change, the transformation in our life, it's going to come from there because we are spiritually connected with Jesus. Okay, And the context of 1 Corinthians 6, actually, in that context, uh, we can read some other verses there in that chapter. I've just put a few verses there. Look at that. Look at those verses, please. First Corinthians 6, verse 13. Now the body is for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. For you were born at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So I've just picked out these few verses from that same chapter. What's the implication? The implication is this. Spiritually, you're connected to Jesus. But because spiritually connected to him, every part of you now belongs to him. Every part of you now belongs to 
Jesus. He saying, the body. See, he says, verse 17, for he who is joined to the Lord is spiritually one with him. Spiritually be connected. But now he's extending that connection all the way to the body. He says, your body is for the Lord. And the Lord is for your body. Your body are members of Christ. Your body also belongs to Christ. Now spiritually you're in Christ. Spiritually you're part of Him. But because you belong to Him, it's not, oh, my spirit belongs to Him, my, my body belongs to the devil. No. All of you, every part of you, now belongs to Jesus. That's the implication. That's what Paul is telling us in that chapter. Because you are joined to the Lord and spiritually you're connected to Jesus, every part of you now belongs to Him. Say verse 20, so you glorify God even in your body, in your spirit, because it belongs to God. Every part of you now belongs to God. Are you understand? Yeah? So, the spiritual union with Jesus means we totally belong to Him. Lesson number 15. We became new creatures in our spirit. Now, every human being has three parts or is a tripart being. Every human person is a tripart being. There are three parts. To a human person, spirit, soul, and body. Right? First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. First Thessalonians 5, 23. Now the God of peace himself sanct sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Spirit soul body so actually you are a spirit being you have a soul and you live in a body so every human being is spirit soul and body actually you are a spirit being you have a soul you live in a body the spirit is that Part of us which is eternal it had a beginning god created it but from then on it will live on and on and on and on it'll never go away your spirit lives on and it is your spirit that can connect to the spiritual realm the soul is the mind the will the emotions that's the soul it's the feeling part of us, the psychological part of us. That's the soul, the mind, will, and emotions. And then we have the body. The body is the house. It's the physical man. This body, this physical body, this mortal body will die. It'll go become dust. It'll go to the ground. But the spirit and the soul will continue to live. You understand the spirit and the soul. So that means the part of the soul of the spirit that can feel, can think, continues. The brain, which is physical organ, will go, but the 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 feelings will continue. So there is a that there's a very close connection between spirit and soul. Okay. So every human being, how many parts? I just purposely said <laughs> every human being has three parts. What is it? The spirit is that part of us that can co contact the spiritual worlds. The soul is mind, will, and emotions. It's a psychological part of us. And the body is the outer person. Right? Which we, are, we can all see. 
So when you when you and I were born again, when we became new creation, what happened? Our spirit was born again. Not the soul, not the body. So, example, if there was a person, let's say he was in, uh, you know, he was 20 years old, of 20 years of age, and he received Jesus Christ, he was born again. Well, that moment he's born again, nothing changed in his body, he's still 20 years old, same height, same whatever. Nothing changed in his soul, he's still whatever, you know, maybe he has, by that time he has been in college. Okay, that's the learning, fine. But in his spirit, he has received new life. His spirit is now connected to Jesus. His spirit has become a new creation. You understand? Now, as a believer, spiritually we have to grow. And as we grow spiritually, the life that God has given to us in our spirit, it has to affect our soul and it has to touch our body and be expressed through our body, meaning our actions, the words we speak, how we live, how we behave, all of that. So the soul or the mind needs to be renewed. The body needs to be crucified. Because the body has all wrong desires, wants to do wrong things. But the spirit is new, it's born again. It has a life of God. And the spirit has to dominate the flesh. The mind has to be renewed. We have to change our thinking. The way we think is, you know, maybe according to the world, according to whatever, however the wrong things we've been taught, all those things. But the mind needs to change. It has to be renewed. Then people will see the new man that we are in Christ Jesus. So if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, the next passage of scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. Paul kind of puts this down for us. Verse 22. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt, according to the deceitful lust. That means, you know, before you became a believer, your former conduct, how you behaved, that was, how you behaved, that was connected to your old man. That behavior was an expression of your old person. Now you got to get rid of that behavior. How do you do it? Verse 23. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So now something has to happen. Our mind needs to be renewed. The spirit, meaning the very essence, the attitude of our mind. Be renewed in the attitude of your mind. Change. The mind has to be renewed. Verse 24. And that you put on the new man. So you become a new man in your spirit. But this new man, you have to put it on. That means people need to see that. Put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So the new man, the new creation that you are in your spirit, is created in the image of God. It is created in righteousness and holiness. That means the new man inside you is holy, it's righteous. But two things we have to do. Our mind has to be renewed, verse 23. And we've got to get rid of the old way of living, the former conduct. The former conduct was aligned to the old man. The old man is gone. You have a new man now. The new man inside you is in the image of God. It's righteousness, it's holiness. Are you understanding it? You're getting it? So, to be a new creation means you're a new person in your spirit. You've received life from the Holy Spirit. 
You're in Christ. And your spirit is created in God's image. Righteous and holy. But now we have to let that affect the rest of our being, which is our mind has to be renewed. We'll talk about that later on. Mind has to be renewed. And this body, this flesh has to be crucified, has to be changed. So that the life of the new creation inside of us can be seen. People can see. Otherwise, what happens? People get born again. They receive Jesus. They become a new person on the inside. But the behavior doesn't change. Still using bad words, cursing, shouting, jumping, making it. People want to, what happened? I thought you became a believer. You received Jesus. Two things. Mind is not renewed. And the flesh is not crucified. So we can't see the expression of the new man. The new man is hidden inside. Outside we're still seeing old behavior, old conduct, still, you know, fighting, doing this, doing that. But, so you believe, yeah, you love Jesus, I love Jesus. But we can't see the change. You understand it? So there is this process that, that we need to go through and we will talk about it. The other thing I want to just point out here in lesson number 16 is when it says new creation, right? New creation. There are two Greek words that are, that are used in relation to new creation. There's the word kainos, which has to do with the essence or the nature of something. And there's the other word neos, which means new in time. That means it didn't exist before. And what's interesting is both these words, kainos and neos, are used to refer to the new creation. So the new creation is new both in quality and in existence, in time. It didn't exist before. You've come into existence. And the very nature of who you are has changed. You're a new creation. Right? Lesson number 17. So we now have a new identity. A new identity. All the things have passed away. All things have become new. So imagine what we meant. Uh, try to uh, imagine the, the example we started with last week. When the slum boy is taken into this family, he has a new identity. He has the name of this family given to him. Everything has changed. New identity. They say from now onwards, anybody asks you who you are, you say, I'm the son of so and so. Because you've been adopted. You belong to this family. You can't say, I, I don't know who my parents are. No, you you're now have parents. These are your parents. They've adopted you. Their family name now becomes your name. You identify with that family. Are you all with me? So that's what happened. We have been adopted into God's family. We are sons and daughters of God. So we have a new identity. Our identity comes from being in Christ himself. Right? We can see, and I just made a small list here on page 28, a few changes that happens to us. The Bible says we were dead, but now we are alive. We were far off, but now we are near. We, are, we were aliens and strangers, but now we are citizens, members. We were darkness, but now we are light. So total change. 
We were once sinners, but now we are saints. We were once guilty, but now we are justified. We were once unrighteous, but now we are the righteousness of God. We were once condemned, but now we are justified. That means we are no longer what we used to be spiritually. All things have gone. All things have become new. So we need to discover our new identity. We need to live out of this new identity. Just for one example, Ephesians 5 verse 8, page 29. You are once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You are once darkness. Now you are light. And so what he says, walk as children of light. Live like this. So the life we now live, it has to come from who we are in Christ, not from who we were. So we live as who we are in Christ. We are light. We are justified. We are righteous. We are saints. So live, walk out of this. Live as children of light. And that's our purpose here in this course, to learn how to live out of that. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Let me just check online. All right. Any questions from the students who are online? All right. Okay, I'm going to stop here. I know um, it's a little. Okay, uh, I know it's a little early. We still have another half an hour, but uh, I don't want to overload. So just keep going. All you're looking very tired and stuff. So uh, I'll just pause here. Any questions before we close? Yeah, Vinay. I can use the mic, Vinay. Just ask the question. So those who are online can also ask questions. Yeah, go ahead. Now the spirit is connected to Christ, and the uh, spirit also has senses. Yes. And uh, whatever comes out of spirit is from God, because it is connected with Christ. And body is also has senses. Yes. The, the world. world. Mm. And uh, soul is in the middle. Yes. And uh, so whatever is coming from the mind is also going to the soul. And whatever is coming from the spirit also is going to the soul. Yes, yes. correct. Yes. So if that is so, uh, does the soul have um, its own mechanism where it can decide on its own or uh, the body can take over it, or the spirit can take over it. Okay, very good question. I hope you understood what Vinay is saying. Okay, so we said all of us, we are spirit, soul, body. So soul is the middle, right? It's like our processing unit, processor. The body has five senses. What you see, hear, feel, smell, taste. Through these five senses, information is coming to the soul, the mind. The mind is processing, deciding what to do, etc. Now, the human spirit also has at least five senses. The human spirit has eyes that we can see, we can feel, we can uh, hear. In the spirit, taste and smell. So we have at least five senses. 
So through the spirit also, we are receiving information. Now, we are connected to God, so do we have the potential to hear from God. But sometimes, some people, if they get connected to wrong spirits, they hear from the wrong spirits also. Right? So that's how these people who do witchcraft, who do black magic, they are able to exp you know, say some things, but they are getting information from the evil spirits. Right? Now, but let's say now, Holy Spirit, God speaks to us in our spirit. So the information comes to our soul. And this is why, and this is where um, our soul, our mind also processes those things. Right? And we can sense. But the mind or the soul has to be renewed. And the more we renew our mind, we're able to discern what is from God and what is from our own flesh. Okay, so we look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Hebrews 4 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12. So the word of God, if we fill our minds with the word of God, it's the word of God that will help us discern what is of the spirit, what is of the soul. What is my own feeling, my own ideas, and what is coming from the Holy Spirit. And it is the word of God that then becomes a discerner of the thoughts and the intents. Are these really from God or are they not from God? Right? So we need to process that and then we need to do something with it. Yeah. So that, that ability, that sensitivity uh, in the spirit to the things of God, to how God is speaking, uh, is something we have to develop. Right? So in the second year, we have a course on developing the human spirit. How do you develop the human spirit? How do you develop the five faculties of the human spirit? So that we recognize what God is speaking. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. But in the spiritual realm, the voice of God doesn't always come with sound. It comes without sound. So it makes it difficult. Now at least you're hearing my sound. You can hear my voice through the mic and all that. But in the spirit, it doesn't always come with sound. The word of the Lord just comes to your spirit. But you need to recognize God is saying something. This is the word. You understand? Answered your question. We have to learn how to do that. We will learn that in second year. All right, let's see now online. Um, uh, Lakshmi, so you, 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 you quoted that statement Behold, I make all things new. So that's from the book of Revelation. I think it's Revelation, uh, Revelation 20, where Jesus says, Behold, I make all things new. And uh, sorry, Revelation 21 and verse 5. Revelation 21, 5. So that is in the context of new heavens and the new earth. That is a different thing. Uh, whereas what we are talking about is the individual becoming a new creation. Uh, behold, I make all things new. Revelation 21 5, it's about new heavens and a new earth. That means everything, all of creation becomes new. Right? Now, it's the same God who is doing it, but these are two different things. Okay. Um, but you know, God is the God who makes all things new. So we he can definitely make that statement uh, with reference to being born again. But the scripture you quoted, Revelation 21 5, in its context, is talking about new heavens and the new earth. Next question from Annie. Uh, at times there's a tendency to forget the identity received in Christ as we journey through life. The circumstances, surroundings, opinions from others, and even our own experiences may blur out, uh, may, may blur out the whole new identity received. How to be consistently reminded about the identity in Christ and live in the freedom received in Christ at all times? So uh, that's a good question. That's the journey we want to make, right? So first of all, we need to receive the revelation, who we are in Christ. 
we're going to look in the scriptures and receive that revelation. And it's got to be deep in our hearts that we are convinced this is our new identity. Then we need to consistently think with that. That means the renewing of our mind, right? Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So our mind has to be renewed to this truth so that we train ourselves to think consistently with this with this truth. So when we renew our mind to the truth, to the word of God, through the process of meditation, meditate in God's word, we renew this. Then no matter what situation we face, people may say things against us, this, different things. Our immediate response is, what does God say? What does the Bible say about me? What does the Bible say about the situation? So that will become our normal response. It's a responding by the flesh. And so it's a responding with our own thinking. We respond in line to the word of God. So the renewing of our mind is very important. And then we will consistently live this out. So Colossians chapter 2, Paul tells us, he says, be deeply rooted in this. Be rooted. You um, be built up. And then you walk. So there is first you're rooted, Colossians, and I'm quoting Colossians 2. You're rooted in him. You're built up in him. Then you walk in him. Right? So we will talk about that, that whole process, how we live out our life in Christ. All right. Um, Sri Raj. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a question or is it a comment, Sri Raj, to keep reading the Bible, analyzing for whom, why, when, and how, and how it relates to my life today. Okay. Right. Um, any other questions? Any questions here? Yes, Daniel. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, did uh, his disciples uh, get baptized in water? Um, not that we know of. The, the 12 apostles, right? There is no record of them being baptized in water after the resurrection of Jesus. So we don't know. Uh, most likely, no. Because otherwise, it would have been stated somewhere, you know. So the, in, the, in the 40 days that he showed himself alive, it was said, okay, Jesus took them and baptized them in water. But that's not stated. Yeah. They were baptized only during John's baptism before. Before, yes. It's okay, I'll be serious. <laughs> yes. The soul of hard work. Mm. And uh, it's frustrating sometimes also. Mm. Because you're fighting Yes. So so the question Vinay is asking is, you know, God made us new creation in our spirit. Why can't he just change the mind and change the body one shot to be fully new? Uh, here's what I think, right? just by looking at overview of scripture. Why, did God, why does God want us to renew our mind and crucify the flesh with the help of the Holy Spirit? Why has he left that, that big part of work for us to do. Right? If God had done everything, then we would have become robots. If he had changed our mind and suddenly changed our body, like in zip, 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 
then we are robots. Like, there's no control. Here, God respects our free will. And the exercise of the free will comes from here, the mind. So, even in making us new creation, He's done so much, but He says, I will still respect your free will. You now take your will and take what I've given to you in the spirit and enforce it on your mind and your body and in your daily life. So that's the kind of people he wants. He wants the people who will choose to follow him. Unlike the angels, you know, where uh, they're being created in a certain way because he's given them free moral agency. But here we have the choice to take what he has done and say, I'm choosing God. And in this process, we are actually defeating the devil. We're saying, devil, I'm not choosing you, I'm choosing God. You know, So you can, every time we say no to temptation, it's like a, you know, giving the devil a nice punch. Thing. Yeah. I'm not choosing you, I'm choosing God. Right? But, Having allowed us to journey through all of this, in its appointed time, he's actually going to do both. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 and also 1 John 3, 2, when we shall see him, we will know him as he is. And we will know just as we are known. So something is going to change at that moment. And we will be like him. Our bodies, we will have glorified bodies. So that is going to happen. But that will happen in the future when Jesus comes to take us home. So that's like Jesus saying, okay, enough time. Bell rings. Ding. I'm coming to take you home. Now I'm giving you a new soul and a new body. An immortal body. Changed. And a new soul. We will know even as we are known. It's totally different. So that will happen. But till that time, he's saying, look, I'm giving you the choice to go through this. You demonstrate your choice to worship me. You demonstrate your choice to. I mean, that's my thinking overall, uh, based on scripture. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Said that the soul continues to live on. Yes. And soul and spirit continues to live on. Yes. And uh, soul has the memories. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it can remember everything that happened to us in this world. Uh, because if that is so, uh, now soul is making so many decisions. And uh, it's going through so many temptations and weak decisions. Will that also continue? Okay. Uh, so what what information do we have in the Bible? So when Jesus gave that story of the rich man and Lazarus, when the rich man was in hell, he could remember his brothers who were still alive. He was in torment. And he said, Oh, Father Abraham, please send somebody to talk to my brothers. Right? So he knew something. Hey, I don't want them to come here. And so send somebody to talk to them. So that's the information we have. But he was in hell. He was in a place of torment. We don't know about heaven. And heaven, we know, is a glorious place, right? It's not a place of torment or uh, pain or sorrow. So my guess is, I'm not, I can't, there's no chapter and verse for this. My guess is that we will, we have a soul, because if you look at John's, in the book of Revelation, John's experience in heaven, he heard, he felt, you know, the, the soul was active. Or when Paul was caught up into the third heavens, he heard things that, you know, he heard and saw things. He says, I can't speak about. But I don't think, my guess is, there will, not be, there will be no painful memories in heaven. In hell, 
yeah, we know there's the torment, and just from the example of this rich man, he could remember things. But that was part of his torment. In heaven, there is no indication. But I, I, we can only guess that there will be, be nothing that causes pain or suffering. And so those memories God will deal with, take it off. As far as we know, God himself says, your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more. So God himself is wiping it off. So there will be no remembrance, no more remembrance of the wrong that we have done and these kinds of things. Yeah, that's, you know, uh, my understanding. Okay, let's pause here for today. I didn't want to overload us here. Uh, I would request all of us to please uh, review whatever we've covered so far. All right? Uh, go back, go through these lessons. Uh, let it just soak in, underline these scriptures in your Bible. Let this truth sink into your heart, right? And now we are going to go step by step. We're going to, you know, uncover more and more things about our new identity, about our identity in Christ. We're going to learn a lot. So uh, keep keep up with this uh, in your in 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 the in your personal time. Let's close in prayer, please. Father, we thank you for your holy word and thank you for the truth, the revelation that you've given to us in your word. We pray, God, that for each of us, these truths will so settle in our hearts and that we will live out of these truths, we'll embrace these truths and walk in them. Help us to understand these things and receive them, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can take your break, please, and get ready for the next class. Thank you.